And recording uh, in both for uh, for John and the Union for myself, this is part of a broader agenda on the effect of digitalization on the financial system, on the monetary system. And for me personally, for example, I worked over the past two years, first on the DMB report on central bank digital currency, then on the ECB report, and now it's a big project. So I started basically alone, and that now they're in the ECB context, more than 60 people working on this. Um, and my next topic will be the effect of digitalization more broadly on the monetary system, including also something we'll discuss today, which is stable coins. And how do the stable coins in the CBDC, how do they relate to each other? Similarly, John and the UN have published studies on the effect of digitalization on the financial system as a whole. So there's a lot going on, and that's not something we discussed already when we met before, just before. Oh, it's not. I can do it like this, I can share. Working by two minutes ago. Did that work anymore? Yeah. No. Let me see. Uh, this is yeah. it's on. I don't see it right down. No. It's not on the phone. It seems like frozen almost. Okay, how did you? I don't know. Okay. So, but now the echo is. Uh, no, no, no. Um, yeah, so the, uh, so this, this is a roadmap. So, for today, since it's at the intersection of law and finance, I decided to, to give also kind of a more legal background to the current forms of money in the monetary system. And there's a whole idea of currency competition, and our paper should be in that context. Uh, and so then we go into the history, as you said, and basically the question is, can we learn something from one case study into the history of, uh, of Amsterdam? Maybe just as sort of a fun fact, Amsterdam is known for having many financial innovations. Most, most known are the stock market, but also the tulip crisis. But I wasn't aware until recently that also actually investment funds originate in Amsterdam. And studying the history of central banking, that there is an increasing amount of authors that trace the history of central banking, and also it's in part to what happened here in 1609 with the, with the Bank of Amsterdam. Um, yeah, and then our interest is, is mostly in how this system evolved over time, and then what we can learn from it for today. Yeah. I mean, the Amsterdam claim to be first on many things is largely based on the fact that Amsterdam, besides being ahead on many things, just has very good record. If you go back to example, central bank like intervention in history and banks or proto banks elsewhere, just less documented. Yeah, yeah. I want to be fed up. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Oops. So, um, so setting the scene, the context for this talk. So we have now currently, we have several forms of money. I'm sure you know them. Central bank money, both wholesale reserves and uh, cash bank deposits. But then actually there is a, another form that's much less well known, but it's crucial for our talk today, I believe. And that's e-money. So if you would read the e-money directive, originally 2010 and 2009 revised, there you see a form of money that's basically outside the banking system. So it, it's, it, it's redeemable in fiat currency and it has to have full banking. Um, and that very much looks like, first of all, the Bank of Amsterdam, how they started, but second, second also like stable coins. And you see that e-money is important when we talk nowadays about what we're gonna do with the uh, with stable coins. Because if you go down here, you, you see the ongoing debate. So there could be new forms driven by technology. I mentioned already central bank digital currency. But the crypto uh, kind of development since the financial crisis, uh, I'm sure you all know that cryptos were not much used except in certain circles for as a means of payment. So to, to, to correct that, the idea was to actually have asset backing so that you stabilize the value and that it would be used as a means of payment, which is one of the three functions of money. 
And that idea looks very much also at how the Bank of Amsterdam started. And as I said already, like e-money. And if you read the current proposals by the European Commission, how to regulate this, because the idea was with crypto, first it was outside the regulated financial system, then it was regulated mainly for anti-money laundering purposes. And now there is a proposal actually with this shift towards stable coins, both wholesale and resale, that regulation should go further. So there was a report by the Financial Stability Board looking at the risks. The European Commission came up with a proposal, and that's now under negotiation. And here you have two types of uh, well, stable coins, because that's not the legal term. So the first is asset reference tokens. And that is when uh, you have backing, but it's not exactly one-on-one -on -one in fiat. And if it's exactly one-on-one -on -one in fiat, it becomes e money. And um, so given that you see now all these different forms emerging, you may say actually doesn't maybe seems a bit crowded to me at the end, because if we're going to have all those forms, it may also not be very kind of transparent to the kind of citizen anymore. What is really now our money? Which ones should I use? Perhaps there could be like currency confusion. Um, and that means that, uh, so I'm of course not the only one who knows this. So you see now an increasing number of publications, I would say re-emerging on currency competition. So I, that's why I put two quotes here from the US. One is uh, uh, from uh, Daniel Sanchez, a researcher in this field, and uh, he, he notes that, uh, okay, so this is driven by technology, but the underlying economics, they're the same. So that's important for our paper when we look at the history. And also uh, James Bullock from the president from the St. Louis Fed, he has a very nice presentation on this. You can find it online. And one of the things he says, which I like, is it's really not new. And it's something that's a debate we've seen also in the past. Now, I thought let's let's actually list the examples I'm most aware of. And the first, of course, is the Bank of Amsterdam story I'm going to tell you. And if you read papers, especially by Quinn and Roberts, who have published a lot on this uh, history, they start also from that of currency confusion, uh, currency competition and what they call confusion of coin. Because what was the case historically in Amsterdam, uh, the political situation was not like you had the United States, like one state, like, as we have today, the provinces, they minted their own coins and it was prescribed how much they should weigh and what would be the value. But what happened, for example, the mint in Utrecht and the mint in Amsterdam, in Utrecht, they wanted to make some more money, so they just reduced a little bit the weight. So that's then the bad money. And that was then used, of course, in trade. So bad money drives out the good money. And that actually led to loss of trust in money. And what happens if there's loss of, tr loss of trust? It starts to hurt trade. And I see a direct parallel between this uh, mechanism and what we see with the cryptos that, yeah, there was like Bitcoin and everything, but it was not like generally used as a form to tra for, tra for payments, exactly because it's so volatile. And then you get stable coins. So how do you stabilize that? That's also what the Bank of Amsterdam did to stabilize because they then said, you can bring the coins to us. We're gonna check them on the weight and we guarantee you that you get it back. And that was the start of what we call rigid stable coin, fully covered by coin. And uh, yeah, I need some authors to relate this to the origin of, uh, of central banking. The second episode, uh, where also you see like interest re emerging, because I took this table from the Riggs Bank, and the Riggs Bank is thinking about e corona. So they also started thinking how actually did we get our monopoly on central bank? Uh, uh, paper money. Um, so cash. Um, and then they go back into the history and see that what happened in the 1800s was you had basically banks issuing their own uh, bank uh, paper, so their own uh, notes. And that actually also led to confusion ultimately that the whole, of course, a whole literature on this free banking, et cetera, but overall it was abolished and the central banks got the monopoly. Also because actually for the people using it as means of payment, 
it was confusing to have these all different forms and what's the value, etc. So coordination. So uh, that was with the coins and with the, uh, the cash money. And now we have the, the cryptos. So at least three episodes where you see the same issue uh, re-emerging. Just to note, as a further introduction to the Bank of Amsterdam, that in the table, maybe it's difficult to read, but you see here when the central bank was founded, the oldest is Sweden, um, where is it? 1668. Then you have the United Kingdom, 1694. So the Bank of Amsterdam was founded in 1609. And actually, the Riksbank and Bank of England were partly modeled after the Bank of Amsterdam because there were some Dutch people both going to Sweden and then working there. King William went to England and that also left the Bank of England. Very brief, but there's much more behind, of course. Um, and the fact is that at the end of the, the 1700s, the Bank of Amsterdam went bust. And that's why we don't have kind of, we cannot make the claim as the Swedes that we have the oldest central bank because the reputation of the Bank of Amsterdam at that point was so bad that it was decided to abolish it and to, to, to create a new institution, the Dutch Central Bank. And actually it was the case that the use of coins lasted longer in the Netherlands because of the trust was not, uh, yeah, in central banking was not immediately established so much because of that history. So then for us, the question is what happened over this point, over this time? Because if it started as sort of a stable coin type arrangement, at the end it went bust. Why, how did this happen? How did this evolve over long periods of time? And sometimes I have the feeling when you see the crypto that it's like we're reinventing the whole history. We start with many different coins, then try to stabilize. You see forms of credit emerging. You see now in the markets actually that there is manipulation going on. So there's a whole new debate. Should we regulate for also like from the from perspective of orderly market functioning? So it's like everything again. Uh, that, that, that's just my, uh, my impression. And um, so that's also why I think it's useful to see these kinds of trends over longer periods. Okay, let's uh, move into uh, the, the, the heart of the story in the Bank of Amsterdam. The, the pictures you see here, the, the left is the old uh, town hall. That one, uh, that was the Bank of Amsterdam was just situated. And then the new town hall where, which, where it was uh, situated later. Uh, just to, to give you kind of flavor of the time. <clears throat> and as I said already, there was confusion of coin. So it started very simple. The Bank of Amsterdam wanted to bring back trust and said, you can bring the coins to us. We'll, we'll weigh them, we'll check them. And then you can be sure that, uh, that you can get it back. By the way, in the process, creating deposit money. And the deposit money, was not like used for sort of everyday people. It was used for the merchants mostly to settle large value transactions. So if you want to compare it to current day, it's more like there is bank reserves, the wholesale side and the retail side of this, uh, this story. And the reputation was very good. So Adam Smith uh, devotes several pages uh, to this topic in his, uh, his famous book. And he also stresses that uh, they were very kind of uh, strict in terms of governance that every coin was backed. So this helped a lot indeed to gain trust. That helped also during the kind of uh, economic boom at, at the time. And also to, to, to actually start developing the financial system up to the point where the guilder became at that point the main international currency. And later it was taken over by the pound and then the US dollar. And uh, the measure we use, so today we would say price stability inflation. Since there were all these coins around, the, the value of the, of the, of the Amsterdam the kind of bank gilder was measured in terms of age of, so 5%, 4 to 5% usually uh, above the current gilders. And the current gilders are the gilders of high quality, so the real coins with precious metal. Uh, uh, because at that point there was not yet fiat money as we know it today, but it was based on the, the silver or gold value of the of the coins, and this reflected that 100% backing. Now uh, you see already towards the end of the period that uh, goes down, and we'll come to that uh, 
later, but the, the main point is over a very long period of time, it worked very well to stress that point. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you define uh, exactly what these measures? Yes, so it's the value of the bank builder, so the deposit at the central bank, or the, the bank of Amsterdam, sorry, it was not the central bank, it was the uh, institution, and versus in terms of uh, coin, so current guilders. So there were different forms of guilders. So there were the coins and there was the deposit. And the deposit was, was worth a bit more. There's all, Quinn and Roberts have a whole story. I can explain why it was five percent higher. But it was also more convenient. Yeah. And also you could use it to settle trade. And the, the bank bank was a trusted institution, a bit like today you settle uh, large amounts through the groups of the central bank. Okay, so this, this worked well in terms of trust. However, uh, the Bank of Amsterdam didn't grow very much. And um, so in 1683, sorry, I should start in 1672, because that was in the Netherlands, the year of disaster, the country was attacked by, from several sides. And so what happened is there was a run on the bank. And uh, actually the, the kind of value went down, I think, from eight to something like two million guilders, which was at that time, of course, much more than it is today. So the bank survived. It turned out that the money was there. Even some of the coins were black, so they withstood the fire that I just showed you in the town hall, and that served to um, to to build the trust in the, in the Bank of Amsterdam that they could withstand this run. However, it was also not very convenient for the bank because the balance sheets were shrinking. So what happened is they tried they they increased the fees to for, to prevent the outflow. Now this is something if you look nowadays at proposals by uh, for Diem or Libra or Tether, for example, Tether. I was searching for this. Actually, they charge a high fee for withdrawals because you don't want that everybody withdraws because then you lose your model. For the DM proposal, actually, there is no withdrawal because there are kind of traders around it. And you have to rely as a user on the secondary market. And only those traders, which I believe is something like an exchange traded fund, they can transact with the underlying association. Now, this is something that Bank Ramson discovered that it's not very handy to have to have the possibility of a run. So they, there was a, a, a new regime and that has two crucial parts. First, it said, we're gonna limit your right for redemption. So those are the unencumbered deposits. So it's not like automatically if you have a deposit at Bank of Amsterdam, you can get your money back. The second is they lowered the fees. So you could still bring coin to the Bank of Amsterdam, get it back like half a year later with much lower fee. But then it was really your coin in a way. It's like a repo transaction. And that made it cheaper. So that actually then it was also used. So that led to a growth. And for the unencumbered coins, it allowed the bank of Amsterdam to start doing monetary transactions. So buying and selling coins in the market. And there you see that it starts to look much more like, well, actually, I should say like, if I would say it's like the first functions it starts to take up from the central bank after first it was for the bank system to bring trust but then it was like uh, you can have a redemption and now it starts to be fiat money there's a nice paper by Quinn and Roberts say how Amsterdam was fiat money but also allowing it to do monetary operations sorry can you clarify the, the way in which the encumbrance work <clears throat> so I understand it's like having a saving deposit type of the yeah, time lock and during that time you couldn't withdraw and people had to accept your script whatever receipt you had and then trade it as some possible <laughs> right yeah is that correct i think it's correct yeah and the, the thing is it's a six months period i forgot to say that and the fees they were two percent before and now they were like quarter to half percent depending on whether it's gold or silver now when you say encumber it means that there was some physical gold physically separated from the rest of the gold yeah which was assigned to that yeah it was earmarked exactly okay. and only if you had this receipt then you could get it back so after six months you had the right to get it back 
but most of the uh, merchants they chose to keep it at the bank so to pay a fee which gave income to the bank of Amsterdam and then to roll it over and that's how the balance sheet started to grow did you pay also fee for the unencumbered deposits no no because there was no right for withdrawal I'm, I'm confused I, 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 so the encumbered deposits you were paying a fee yeah and the unencumbered were you as far as i know there was no fee but you could still make it liquid by relying on the secondary markets so the secondary market started to develop and there you could trade your deposit at the central bank for coin so when you so how did the bank make money if i bring money and i say if i want it unencumbered they would charge me a fee up front but then there would be no interest rate either way no fee no interest rate is that right well i have not read any uh stories about people bringing unencumbered money to the bank that's more like when they gave a loan to the voc then they create the loan on the liability side and the asset side is then unencumbered however if you want encumbered so you want to get it back like a repo then you specifically bring it so if you how i read it is if, you know, if when you bring your coin you have a right to get it back in six months and the other part the unencumbered is created through monetary transactions through loans so, so it's a loan so there's no, yeah there's no coin behind that covered so that basically the asset matching that is a loan yeah no, yes and the thing is exactly you're right and that's where you get this discrepancy however the sources of income were the fees and the interest on the loan those were the main sources of income so over time the Bank of Amsterdam is building its capital, so it's accumulating coins. And there it starts to do this. Yeah, so indeed, it, it, you, you're fully, it's good that you. Uh, okay, but then the graph is wrong, right? You don't want, you don't have any coins no, I over there. It does confuse, I mean, wrong, it's confusing. You see? It, yeah, it could be. It suggests it's yeah, all. Yeah, no, it's no, no, that's a good, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and so this allowed it. So, so it started in the payment system. There's a whole debate how central banking started to finance war in the payment system. This is an example of how it started in the payment system. And then it started to take on kind of a monetary role also. And um, the first I want to mention is the settlement liquidity. Because if you look at how Target functions today, there's intraday credit for. So the, the, the wholesale transactions, they run through the books of the central bank. Those transactions are very large relative to the deposits that the banks hold. So then if you have a shortage, you can borrow from a central bank because you know I'm going to get incoming flow later and you get intraday credit. So within the day and monetary credits more overnight. So that's to facilitate the timing of big payments. If you want to do that, you cannot be a rich. So if you want to give this credit, uh, uh, then you, you should actually give the loans. And so we were very keen on seeing like, is there any evidence of this in the Bank of Amsterdam? And since the main customer, the, the biggest corporation at the time was the VOC, you see actually that this kind of short-term credit, and of course it's not like today intraday, but it's still related to the timing flows, did actually happen because the ships, they had this kind of seasonal patterns, basically arriving more in the spring, uh, and uh, or, or the other way around, I forgot exactly. But anyway, it's a seasonal pattern. I have the data later. And then over time, it also started to do monitor operations, as I said, with the coins uh, and giving credit, and even actually acting as a lender of last, last resort. So you see gradually building up of central bank tasks. That's why we call it prototype, without becoming kind of modern day central bank, which has actually much stronger governance. I would say. Because that's where backing of the of the state. Yeah. So I'm just trying to get the, the the term right. So don't you want to call? So you had one part that was secure deposits and back, fully backed, and then the bank anticipated the flow of income, for which he kind of wrote, you know, wrote an asset there and lent it. But that's an unbacked asset, unsecured. Is that the right financial construct? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Um, okay, but it's useful for interpretation. Yeah, of... so, so 
from 1683, the system is if you bring coins to the bank, you get them back six months and you pay a small fee. Over, so yeah, over time they earn money, so they also have other coins and they start to give loans. So you see that not everything is backed anymore. So it starts to become more like a bank instead of a fully backed institution. Yeah, no, but I'm, I understand. But uh, the question is whether the, the deposits that people brought were lent or not. What you say seems to suggest they were not. Alternatively, there was a way for people to invest in uh, unsecured. Plans. Yeah, I mean, that one of the yeah, no, no. So the deposits that they brought, they were there in need, they were kept separate. In okay. And that was the encumbered part. And were also deposits that were not banked. Uh, yes. For example, if they gave a loan to the VOC, you see an uh, unbacked uh, uh, deposit occurring. That's more in the later period. So, well, uh, they created so that, a deposit. So they give a loan and therefore create a deposit yeah. which a VOC could use, but it wasn't yeah. backed by coins, but only yeah. by its own loan. Basically, it's like the first step is you create trust. You say we have hundred percent fully backed. Once you have that trust, you and then you see that yeah, we have hundred percent assets. Only coins are not earning much. That the incentive is to take more risk, start giving loans, and that's also what you see in the discussion now on stable coins. Like, is there really the asset reserve there? For most of the part of the history of Amsterdam, it was like close to hundred. Only at the end, when there was the big shock, then you see it starts to fall actually up to 30% only in terms of points. You know, when the, the Spanish fleet brought all the silver about 100 years before, uh, well, a bit like I said, from the Latin America, they started a lot of silver was landing in Sevilla, Salamanca, etc. They created their own banks where merchants deposited money. And there was actually quite a bit of debate. There was some ancient book called the Banking School of Salamanca. And it's all based on whether the moral foundation of banking should be based on deposit and keeping or whether you could lend. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the moral of course, yeah. justification. Yeah. Well, the, the, I like the end of the analogy because you see it also here. The moral story is very strong at the beginning. Uh -huh. Yeah. And later it starts to deteriorate. That's we also have a, like a footnote in the paper but on the governance, how the governance deteriorated at the end. Some authors know that actually the age of the, 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 the people that watch the, the guards, that's the, the, the coins are there, it dropped. So they couldn't withstand the pressure to lend against the VOC. And so the governance just was not strong enough at the end of the day. Um, and that brings me to the point on governance. So. I believe this looks very much like a conflict of interest that you have also in investment fund regulation. Because in investment fund regulation, you have a separation between you own the ownership and the manager. And the ownership, the, the owners, they, they, they have, in this case, they, uh, for a stable coin also, they have to rely on like the, the value is there that's promised because it's like one-on-one -on -one promise. However, if you are the manager, you can see that, yeah, but you sit on all the safe assets. So you have a temptation to do a bit more risky, decrease the backing, start making loans. And that's what you see exactly in the history of the Bank of Amsterdam also over time, especially when there are big shocks. And that's also the story at the end, but I don't know if I have time to go through everything. But then actually there was the shock of the fourth Anglo uh, Dutch war. They blocked the harvest for the VOC. So the shipping went down drastically and uh, the Bank of Amsterdam started to give like uh, lender of last resort uh, lending to the VOC. And then you see this backing, which was close to 100, it drops to like 30%. And then the agile starts to also decline. And that's what we have in the regressions. That's, that's good. So the, in any case, we've seen now the conclusion so that we don't have to worry like, you know, rushing through the slides and just a <laughs> nice discussion here. Um, Okay, so over time it, it, it uh, took on more uh, roles of a central bank without actually having the full governance. And that's then a lesson for today also that you should have this strong governance to, to, to work in the interest of uh, basically uh, the, the common good. And so we spoke about settlement liquidity. So that is this uh, chart. So what it shows is the, the ship arrivals. So the, the seasonal patterns 
in uh, income. So, you know, financing a ship going out and then waiting till you get the return. And in the meantime, you have a short term loan from the Bank of Amsterdam, which is very much like seasonal credit, uh, like intraday credit, like today. And also, when you put it in a, 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 co a correlation, you see almost one correlation of one between the month on month change in the loans to the VOC and uh, the, I should say that correctly, unencumbered deposits. Yes, because that's what we just discussed at length. This, the other thing is that the, the, the idea of monetary operations. So when Bank of Amsterdam had this kind of additional stock through its earnings of coins. So when the IG was high, it could enter the market and uh, do these transactions or similar when it was low. And that's very similar to open market transactions a central bank does today. And this, uh, this, this graph is a, a vector of regression to illustrate that, that there was a response in the unencumbered metals uh, to shocks in the, uh, in the agile. Yeah. Sorry, too many questions. And where are most loans to the VOC? Yeah, yeah. And that's actually what you see here, because the blue is the East India, and you see especially in the later periods, but also the town treasury. So the town treasury, they also took loans and often didn't pay it back. So it was like paying dividends to the municipality. So they, they used it actually also for income of the town, because it was a profitable uh, organization so it was a nice income for the for the city of Amsterdam and then there were loans also to the the, the loan the town trade the, the loan chamber but then you see also here the metal stock covered most of the period fully the assets except in the late period when the bank went down hi I have a quick question for the graph in terms of like builders so I'm not very familiar but what was the like Purchasing power of the builder, like what could you accomplish? Because I see the numbers, like it's 30 million builder. Yeah. What does that mean? Like, to... Yeah, that, so I don't, it's for me also, I don't know, because you have to know at the time what the prices were. I don't know. But it was big money, it was wholesale, and it financed kind of the VOC and also the, the transactions of the merchants. Okay. Thank yeah. You. The thing here is also the why we have this chart here. If you look around 1666 then and 1673, there was actually a panic in the markets. So now we get to the story. So you see, it starts like fully backed because of its role in the payment system. It starts to lend to bridge timing differences. So full rigid stablecoin in modern day parlance is difficult. And then there are shocks. What, how do you survive if there are shocks? So first, the very important shock was 1763 because there was a merchant bank, I think it was called Neuville, went down, went bust. So there was a panic in the market, credit risk. So think about the global financial crisis. So what do you do? You go to the trust institution. So you see there, this is the spike, the funds growing at the central bank, the bank of Amsterdam. Sorry, I say central bank because I so often say central bank, I should say it in this context. Uh, so it worked a bit like, uh, so here you see this panic of 1673. And we compare that to data, US data for uh, the Federal Reserve, the inflow, uh, and also the pandemic. So you see this pattern emerging in trusted institution. Of course, the question is, this is really so good, so such backing that it's really uh, can survive almost any shock. And that's uh, kind of the final part of the, the story uh, when there was a real big shock. And I see this, these external events really like what we have nowadays, like the pandemic. We had, we had actually in the last 15 years, we had three major ones. And before that, we had for a long time nothing, like the global financial crisis, the euro crisis, and the pandemic. Each time you see that the central banks, they play this role. And something uh, also a very heavy shock was the, the fourth Anglo-Dutch war because the, the trade was blocked by the British. So they, there was also things going on in the US and they wanted to sort of the, the Dutch, they were trading still with the US and the British wanted to block that. And that was actually also really the decline of the, the wealth of the Dutch Republic. And there was a strong hit to the 
uh, to the shipping and to the Dutch economy. And so this is the, the battle of the Dodger Bank, which is in the North Sea. It's still kind of give you the, the feeling. And here you see data. So we collected additional data next to the Bank of Amsterdam, also on shipping. And there's a big collapse in the shipping. And that is particularly difficult for the Bank of Amsterdam because that's credit risk, right? And so you see now also these loans, they give credit risk. And if you don't build buffers, so that's when uh, the, the, the loans to uh, the East India Company they started to increase heavily. And also they couldn't pay it back enough. So if, if you see the papers by uh, Quinn and Roberts, they say that around 1783, I think it was 1784, technically the Bank of Amsterdam was, was bankrupt. And then it all depends, like how is the fiscal backing? Well, modern day central banking has the backing of the state, but this was the city of Amsterdam. And if the city of Amsterdam was also impoverished, then this backing was not there. And moreover, they had always used it to extract income and not to build buffers. Because if yeah, well, you spoke about buffers before the seminar, if you don't build the buffers while you give the loans, then that, that can go wrong. And that's basically what happens. And Sorry, one, one, one little clarification. So, uh, what do you mean by backing? I mean, uh, did the city of Amsterdam take any commitment to bail out the Bank of Amsterdam or was more informal? Yeah, how I understand, they didn't take any commitment, but then there were some kind of small loans to recapitalize, but it was not enough. And then it was uh, around that time, uh, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, but then what the Bank of Amsterdam did, it was not like transparency, but it was like kept secret. So officially the mandate was always like no lending, but in the reality by now, and I'm sure that there must have been rumors from like that. So how I imagine this works is like, there are rumors in the market, like how solvent is the Bank of Amsterdam? Of course, everybody could see what was happening to the economy. And that's how we wanted to measure this also, because at, in the long run, there should then be a link between the agile, which is like the, you know, like the inflation target nowadays, the value, and the uh, loan share. And the loan share is like a proxy here also for credit risk, because we, of course, we don't have risk measures. So we put that in a co-integration, and then exactly actually after you, uh, well, there are some structural breaks, but that, that comes out. And that is this, uh, this equation where you see there's a regression of the agile on the loan share. And then the, the thing to look at is the, the test results for null hypothesis of unit group. It doesn't work on the screen, but it's, it's a lot, almost last row. It was not confirmed in the first regressions, but then when you apply the possibility of a structural break, which the data said happened exactly in 1789, when there was in France the storming of the Bastille, when you see a drop in the agile, then actually the whole, also the econometrics say that if you adjust for that, there was, is indeed such co integration, and that, that's the final, the, the, the two other uh, columns. So you see there the, the dummy for, is one for the period later. So basically, 2.9 means a almost 3% drop in the agile, like a structural rate. And then there is uh, also a, a short term equation as with any error correction model. So if you look at the error correction term, it's the first one, that is the um, adjustment towards long term equilibrium. So you should see it like in the long term, there's a risk in the loan share in the agile. And then there's this equilibrium. And every period you make up that disequilibrium. And this is at uh, this point 17 actually corresponds because these are monthly data to six months, which happens to be exactly the period for uh, the, the encumbered deposits. So you had to wait six months before you could get it out. So that suggests that indeed at that point, people took it out after six months. The, the, the run is not any more instant, like when you have full backing and, and reliability at par, but it's delayed. Uh, and that's also in the balance uh, sheet data happening. So um, I like this quote from uh, Stephen Quinn and William Roberts. So they are, they said it worked very well for a very long time, especially due to the reforms of 1683. 
and would bring the bank to great heights, but it, it, they compare it to uh, Icarus, but in the end it was flying too close to the sun, so it went down. And um, so that's when we then, of course, then the, the whole discussion often is like, how can you kind of compare such a historical event, it's just one case study, to, to the things that happen today. Well, I think there is something to learn yet on the one end, but on the other end, it was a different time. But I think it's nice to see the underlying incentives, the economic incentives. If you start with 100% backing and you have separation between the ownership of the assets and managing them, and the manager is actually a private institution that wants to make profit for its shareholders, it has an incentive to reduce the backing and to start lending, to increase profits. And once you have the confidence, that gives you the flexibility, the room for maneuver to do that. And that's what you see here. It may work for a very long time, <coughs> uh, but it, 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 at some point, you know, how far you bring it, and then there are shocks you could also. And that's the story here. So that's why we have this conclusion. If stablecoins stick to their government rules, they provide limited settlement liquidity. So you cannot have it in the center of the payment system and then also expect to give liquidity when there is a need. But if you don't stick to it, yeah, that's, uh, that's again problematic. Then, then you're basically not a stablecoin anymore. So you see this in evolution towards banking. And uh, so that's why we thought let's compare kind of modern day alternatives to. Uh, to the proposals that are around. Um, so I guess a lot of, I hope, well, I assume, but anyway, I, I think lots of people know about Tether, DP more Coin and Libra. There's, by the way, also Finality, which is an important initiative. It's more on the wholesale. So we thought, let's just try to compare it. What are the assets? Is it wholesale or retail? And importantly, is it a rigid stable coin or is it more flexible that it can land? And there it's important if it's a bank or if it's not a bank. So, for example, for JP Morgan coin or a finality, I think it's similar. If you have a system where the assets are in terms of central bank reserves and you earmark that, and the banking side of your uh, business can still give loans, that's much more flexible than when you have a non bank. Like, like pure e-money, as I said in the beginning, where you always have to maintain this backing, then you have zero flexibility to give any support to the, the payment system that uh, where you're actually in the middle if you are such a coin. Um, yeah. And of course, what you see here, asset silver, gold and coins, that's quite different from uh, assets held by, uh, for example, proposed by Libra and Audi, um, low risk securities or 100% central bank assets. So it matters also very much like how it's structured specifically, I would say. Sorry, <clears throat> on the uh, JP Morgan coin, this is the debate that came when the, this Fed official tried to promote the Euro mutual fund that could hold claim on bank reserves at the Fed, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we've got here. Well, yeah. I think it's oh. Yeah, well, I think it's generally there's a discussion on CBDC versus hybrid CBDC. Hybrid CBDC could be something that's proposed by some, I'm not saying, but that's when you have private institution having 100% uh, assets in a central bank account and then issuing its, uh, yeah, kind of uh, stable coin. So there was, a, I think that was blocked, at least the, the wide retail distribution that was blocked from objection by the Fed. Okay. I, that's what I, I know, remember. I have a related question in the, in the chat. Uh, okay. If you yeah. Have to... yeah, sure. Because I think yeah. we are up to the questions anyway. Yeah. I'm so, Sam so Bilou is asking, uh, I'm reading it literally, then maybe you can unmute yourself if you want to discuss it. If uh, you are mainly discussing asset back, Stable coins, but the ability of the bank of Amsterdam creating money makes it more similar to algorithm stable coins, such as uh, ill fated basis. Uh, is it not the case? I think the paper should distinguish between various types of stable coins, such as asset backed stable yeah. coins versus algorithm when comparing stable coins with the yeah. Bank of and I think that's a good point. For sure, fully agree there are different types algorithm based. What, what is your backing indeed? 
how I see it, but we can discuss is when you have the coins, that are, those are the assets. So they are tangible assets. So those that were at that time the most kind of hardcore assets you could have. So, but maybe I'm so, because there are also stable coins that are crypto on crypto. So yeah, you know how how safe are the assets? But maybe I, I'm not sure if I've, that's we cannot have a discussion now. I don't so, know. I, was I would see clarification. If you, I don't know whether what exactly does an uh, algo uh, stablecoin do? It uh, creates a scarce supply or something. Yeah, so they say like we have only so much. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, but there's not still it's like not if, yeah, yeah, like Bitcoin does that also. They say we have so much, and then we stop, uh, but there's nothing behind Bitcoin in terms of assets, right? It's just the fact that there is something you commit to be scarce, yeah. Yeah, to create actually artificially some scarce thing. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, still something scared that you plan. Yeah, uh, but the, but the question that's an important point I think in terms of governance, because how do you uh, govern how much money is out there? And then indeed you can say, well, we have a, an algorithm, or we say we have a fixed supply. We, for example, we move the economy, but central bank literature on this rules versus discretion. There's a whole literature saying that, yeah, but for shocks, etc., it's also good to have discretion. You can never, like, oh, but wait, why do you, call it? I mean, stable coin don't need to be a central bank, they can yeah. be a bank. So I don't think that you should push the analog. I mean, a stable coin is not trying to be a central bank. Yeah. But at the same time, if you create your own currency and you're in the center of that world with that currency, I believe it it's pushes you a bit in that direction. It's interesting because I mean, on, on this point, if I can uh, jump in uh, uh, on, on the discussion, I mean, uh, actually with Eduardo and Patron sitting here just on this uh, this room physically, uh, we had this uh, idea that um, one limitation of any kind of uh, blockchain based currency yeah. is the ability to convert into fiat money. Which is, in our view, controlled by the government because yeah. the government gives the monopoly on 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 on, on legal tender. Yeah. Uh, so, do you think this is something uh, worth this? Because this gives also, in a sense, an, a, a privilege to the government that by act of law, yeah, can stop uh, the 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 private digital currency from being used massively. By controlling the power to convert into legal tender, yeah, I believe that you can control yeah. how much how much private currency. Yeah, so the, again, my personal view, but I believe that goes to the heart of the current debate on how to regulate stable coins. Uh, and because I showed you the beginning, the Mika proposals, as far as I know, there is no link there between uh, sovereign currency and uh, stable coins. But we could have a situation that private coins become so big that they have monetary implications. And there I've is heard that, but still, uh, so long as the government asks taxes to be paid in legal tender, yeah. and there are other uh, requirements that you know must be paid in legal tender, the government controls a legal tender. You, you, you got to get a license as a bank, and the government gets yeah, yeah. a license yeah. to yeah, convert yeah, I legal agree. tender. Yeah. So either you push out legal tender and nobody uses legal tender, and then you can make fully private yeah. currency. Otherwise, the government has something to say. That was our point. Yeah, least. yeah. No, and I agree to that. Um, and it's a bit hypothetical because currently the government regulates, of course, the banks. There is legal tender, we pay taxes in euro, and we don't see any stablecoin competitor taking big market shares in the payment market. However, the whole idea of the discussion, as I read it, is that. Yeah, but is that also true for the future with the network effects that you have in social platforms? Could it be that we see a big take up of an alternative? That's the idea of currency. I don't know. Personally, I believe it, it's much more likely in kind of less developed financial systems. Mm. El Salvador took Bitcoin now, but of course that won't fluctuate. But what if they take a stable coin? And then you can use some of the institutions of that stable coin, for example, the algorithm, they say we print so much. That could be feasible, but whether it would also get an uptake in uh, like advanced financial systems, 
uh, is uh, is difficult to predict. But seems some people are really worried about that, like that's, like that, and that's the, you can have different views on there. And uh, your your view is as good as mine because I cannot predict the future. But we do know that there are big network effects in social uh, in, in uh, platforms. So, so what we were saying is not about like an exercise in prediction, as so long as the government says that taxes can only be settled in legal tender and governments control legal tender, there's no way any private issuer can take that away from government. Yeah, that's a fact. I yeah, mean, that's I a fact. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's a fact. Uh, yeah. uh, questions. So can I ask a very quick question? Just about the about the analogy between the, the Bank of Amsterdam and the second coins we observe today. So what was the, the level of transparency back then? For example, when at some point they started issuing loans. Yeah. Were the depositors aware of this? That no, it's not 100 percent anymore, but perhaps it's yeah. 70, 70. And how does it compare to the level of transparency of these stable coins? And the second part of the question is related to the first part. It's about the main difference here is that back then there was a monopoly that was providing these services, the Bank of Amsterdam, I presume. Yeah. But here we have many coins, perhaps the incentives are a bit different because you might have incentives to start investing and going away from this 100% banking. But you know, there are alternative options, so you might get a run just because of this. So, but they're both in relating to the level of transparency. So my question is about this, where the depositors are yeah. there, or at some point they realized. Yeah, so I searched for that, and as far as there was no transparency, but it was what you read about that probably was more informal because it was like also a small community of merchants at the end, so that they probably, but it was not like they published, they didn't publish their books. Like So at some point they just realized that this, but yeah. the pastor started giving a lot of loans. I know many yeah. people wrote a loan so many. Yeah, and, oh yeah, and then what happened is that uh, now I remember the, the French invaded and they called for opening of the books. And then it turned out that, of course, it was not like a very good situation. And uh, yeah, that was also the further step in the downfall. But we have similar discussions with the teller today. Yeah, that's why. Right. And I looked it up on the website. They have now an accountancy declaration of March this year. We have full backing. Because there's all actually some people wrote columns also pointing to this uh, tether should open its uh, its faults. Um, so I haven't followed it, but the, the discussion is there. But and your second question, I'm not sure if I understood. So it seems that then the level of transparency was quite similar back then compared to perhaps what we have now in the sense that there's no much transparency. So that makes the analogy stronger. But I think what is different is that here there are many coins. So in the sense that the incentive to misbehave is disciplined by some reputation concerns, even though you're not a monopoly anymore. Yeah. So is it something that you could Yeah, and it? also it was partly public Bank of Amsterdam. So it was still the city of Amsterdam also having in mind to support the economy and then what the purpose was they also actually i think it's dual because they also got good revenue from it but it's not like a purely it's not like a purely private thing yeah there's a, there is in the shot a lot of discussion on this eh? yeah, Valeria, and then we go on. okay well that's a good that it triggers a discussion because See, i, I think here we're really at the edge indeed of, of where we stand it's nice that we end there, that it facilitates such discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Vale. Yeah. I um, wanted to pose like, some questions. Maybe if you agree with what Alex was saying, because I think that um, so I was saying like as long as we need to do taxes, then yeah, we like all these alternatives will not fly. But I think it's mostly a matter of visibility and uh, network effect, as you were saying. And this, for instance, is the reason why we got so scared for Libra. Because one, like, one thing is to have like better and like something that only like some geeks know about. And one thing is to have enough payment on WhatsApp and Facebook. Yeah. And so here I would like to have your opinion on like, for instance, the difference between these blockchain based private money, like potentially Libra, and private money that already exists in the form of e money that you talked before, yeah. that it's already there. And that, in my opinion, for how I see it, that's the reason that, that, that is pushing central banks to develop 
their own stable coins or like the discussion about the digital euro. Yeah. Basically, I think that the idea is to create an alternative that is viable, standardized, and usable Euro Europe wide or global wide eventually to compete with these private uh, money suppliers that already exist. And whether they are based on blockchain or not, I think the difference is also uh, not so much. So maybe you can tell yeah. me more about it. Well, basically, I agree with you. Because in the, uh, so I think you explained it very well. And I see in the, in the discussion, so there are two kind of re responses. One is making CBDC, the other one is regulating. On both sides, you see that 2019 is really a turning point. And so I followed the debate on CBDC. You see it emerging in Sweden, Canada, then also Netherlands, because cash goes down. But it doesn't take off as much yet as, as then a year later, because when now the ECB is also, the whole euro system is working on it as a project. And one of the big arguments was monetary sovereignty and digitalization. Yeah. So I think that gave the push. And also on the regulatory side, the MICA proposal came. It's, it's really like, let's put it like this. If you read the MICA proposal, the crypto assets, they are basically lightly regulated. But where it's really making more effort is on this kind of yeah, asset reference tokens and e-money tokens, which is exactly because of the prospect that it could function as a means of payment in society at large. Yeah. And that made a big difference in, in, in the whole mindset in this discussion. So, but I'm basically saying the same, I think, as you just said. <laughs> I put this chat in the big screen so, so we can follow the lively discussion in the chat. And Alex, if you want to read I will try, but it's tough. I mean, I, I put my, I don't know where you can read anything there in the big screen, but essentially here is, so it's Balash and, and Osen, and I'm trying to summarize their joint views. One-to-one um, uh, -one feedback crypto cannot take on risk via lending. Uh, because it promised uh, redeemability one to one, uh, and uh, bring, that's that's one point they're making. And the second one is the tether is not transparent yeah. in their claim to ensure uh, one to one uh, redeemability. Yeah, uh, because there is no evidence that they are fully backed by dollars. Well, you can say more than that. They, they just say that they consider loans to itself to be a suitable form of reserves. I mean, in that sense, I don't think you can claim that even Tether can be a platform benefiting from platform attack. I mean, it is a platform. It doesn't have the compelling nature that the Bank of Amsterdam had, which was a unique basic monopoly for a stable coin, and then it becomes central bank. I mean, Tether is more a private experiment. Yeah, with no, no discernible external effect, I would say. Yeah, but Bank of Amsterdam didn't have taxing capacity. But that's why I asked: is yeah. the city of Amsterdam backing, making a commitment, no commitment, just loans, and they were not enough? So, and also the city of Amsterdam didn't have taxing yeah, capacity. Right. That, that there was a natural platform, and your work, your your gold was safe there. So that's taxing enough. I mean, no, I mean, you know, the moment you make loan, the moment you make, you, make, you, make, you, make uh, uh, you anticipate purchasing power. The, the moment you, do, you play the central bank, I mean, one to one convertibility, we all would like it. Also in the chat, it was like if there was a credible promise of one to one convertibility, you store the gold, you store anything in some vault, you're fine. But then, let us take also the story, if I understood yeah. your story correctly, I mean, the bank around will start making loans. And there is a link with fiscal capacity. If, 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 you, if you make receipts, if you make money out of loans, yeah. then it's... Uh, yes, to be back to reserve the stuff. Can, can I pick on this? Because I think, so if, if, you, read, uh, if you read me, uh, my, my big concern is, okay, uh, crypto assets are crypto assets. But then when it comes to asset reference token, uh, I see a lot of similarity with uh, money market funds. Uh, yeah, me too. And getting back to your incentive idea, in, in Mika, when, when, uh, when Mika regulates or kind of proposed to regulate asset reference token, there are a lot of incentives to become prime money market funds. 
which promise redeemability yeah. one to one, but has no fiscal has yeah. no fiscal backup and has no capacity to um, to guarantee that in times yeah. of uh, in times of hard. Do, do you see this, and how would you act on that? And yeah, no, I agree, and uh, so I see the F asset reference tokens as a form of uh, investment fund and money market funds is a particular type of investment funds that promise a stable value. Just yes, so yes. And the e-money I see more as it was intended in the e-money directive with 100% backing, redeemability at par and without any fees. Because I, I agree basically with everything that's been said on that on this, also with uh, the, the, the right the comments. Uh, and in addition, uh, so, so I cannot really know if the if the money is there or not. So, but I do see that I was checking a lot if there's a fee, and apparently the fee is very high to prevent every to prevent kind of, kind of people getting back the money. That is something that would not be allowed for e-money. Then you have to have it redeemable at par with no fee. Um, so yeah. Why should, why should I set an e-money not an asset preference? For? I, I don't I don't see how kind of business model wise uh, yeah. e-money token are yeah so you would go for the lighter the asset reference probably yeah. if you can choose well, and then there is still a lot of discussion indeed in this debate. So it's not set up issue by the central bank. That's a different business. Right? No, e money can be set be issued by private companies. Yeah, but it's not credible. So the yeah. point is, it would never be fully credible. And in that sense, there is a limit. You can say e money should, but yeah, it does. No, no, so okay. then yeah. e money is by definition yeah. my money. Yeah. <laughs> no, but bank. that's consistent with the fact that it has remained small. Yeah. Yeah. And also for the money, there are a lot of legal loopholes. So when you see in Mika yeah. the type of assets that can be can, can be considered fully liquid. Yeah, I, I, I yes said no. for this also in e money indeed. And then you had to go to another directive and I saw the list. I was like, yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah, so excellent discussion. Uh, it seems we have like overall pretty similar thoughts on this. I haven't seen any really big disagreements, as far as I know. Um, and uh, but it's this is really at the edge of the current developments. We have to see what comes out of NICAR, the, uh, the the kind of uh, agreement. Finally, of course, if they reach that, uh, so we only have to propose now. We have to see also what comes out of CBDC, and we have to see what comes out of stablecoins. So that's why, as I said, we're really at the edge here in a kind of period with a lot of exciting uh, developments. If there's uh, any final pressing question from the audience here or online, is uh, is now the time, Adia? Uh, I uh, just uh, I'm not sure uh, what, uh, with what you said, what, what you think about it about the uh, possibility of qualifying Tether as e money under the M money directly. Uh, do you think uh, Tether qualifies as uh, as e money? Which one? Tether. No, not now because it it, it doesn't uh, have the same guarantees. But I. Well, my current opinion is again private. If you do this, you should have a hundred percent backing. Uh, if it becomes big, the, the backing should be in central bank money, and then there should be monetary control and supervision. And this is actually very much like a report the ECB brought out on e-money in 1998, where they gave all these requirements. At that time, they actually said it should be a credit institution. But the thing is, if you have 100% backing, you're not a bank. So it's a different type. So if you then read the e-money directive, you see it's an e-money institution legally. But as Enrico said, also it stays outside, it stays small because it's not credible. But if it would become big, and I think that's what you see in the earlier periods, both of the Bank of Amsterdam and the bank not monopoly, then it's up to the sovereign to act and to bring it back within the control. Okay. So I, if you regulate it, it, it should not be a sort of loose way, in my opinion. And I would just say I don't I don't see Tether as any chance to become a stable coin in the popular sense. There's no chance. They don't even seem to be trying very hard. <laughs> I mean they have uh, their reserves are deposited in the Bahamas in something called a crypto bank. I mean and they consider the loan to themselves to be safe. I mean, I mean you can have fun online, but it's not a serious side. So it's been a really uh, nice. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much for accepting the invitation and for this uh, wonderful presentation and discussion. Online. We couldn't pick up all the questions, but uh, thanks for joining us.